Hello everyone. Today we're starting on the last part of this section, circular motion and satellites. Here we'll be talking about uh, some of the changes that we can make to satellites' velocities and how that will affect their orbit. Now we know that at any given altitude there is going to be a particular speed for which an object is in a stable circular orbit, right? We can see that if we're further out from a planet, then our orbital velocity will be slower than if we're closer in. This is called the orbital speed, or the orbital velocity, of the object. Remember, speed is simply a measure of distance over time, whereas velocity uh, is a vector, so it points in a direction. Now, higher orbits have a smaller orbital speed than lower orbits which we can see over here. That can be derived simply by looking at the equation for centripetal acceleration and, orbital, and uh, gravitational acceleration. Now if an object's actual speed is slower than its required orbital speed, that means that it will fall back to Earth, right? Gravity will be too strong for the centripetal force and it will pull the uh, satellite or other orbiting object uh, toward the Earth. Eventually it will reach the Earth's atmosphere and that will slow it down even more. So it will follow a shortened elliptical trajectory. If we were to continue drawing a uh, this line, it would end up uh, being an ellipse and end up right where it started. This is because as it gets closer to the Earth, it speeds up a bit. That's one of Kepler's laws, of course. Now as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, it will slow down. And this means that uh, because we have an atmosphere, it won't follow an elliptical trajectory. It will get close to Earth and then just sort of uh, start moving inward even more. Now if an object's actual speed is faster than its orbital speed, then the gravitational force won't be strong enough to pull it around in a circle, right? This means that we'll be moving away from the Earth, which we can see in this animation. So we'll follow an elongated elliptical trajectory. Eventually we'll come down, move in an ellipse, and come back, uh, ending up exactly where we started. So once again, we can see that we're following an ellipse that ends back where it started. Only in this case, the focus of the ellipse closest to us is the Earth, instead of the focus furthest away from us. That means that instead of heading towards the Earth, we're heading away from it. As it turns out, it's possible to be moving so fast that you don't come back. In that case, you're not following an elliptical trajectory, you're following a hyperbolic trajectory. Now, if an object's actual speed is exactly equal to its orbital speed, then it will move in a perfect circle. It will remain a fixed distance from Earth instead of changing. So it will follow a circular path at uniform speed. And the Earth's gravity provides a centripetal force, right? So it, the force on the object will always be pointing toward the center of the Earth. And it will always have the same magnitude because we're always the same distance. Now if the gravitational force suddenly disappeared, we know that there will be no force acting on the object and so it will travel in a straight line. So this arrow represents the velocity of the orbiting object. It will always be pointing in the direction in which the satellite is moving, so it will always be changing when it's in orbit. Now objects in stable orbits, including moons, are called satellites. Normally we use the term satellite today to refer to an artificial satellite used for things like radio broadcasting or other communications. But in a physical sense, anything in orbit, whether it's a space shuttle or a moon, counts as a satellite. Remember that even for a circular path, the velocity of the satellite uh, will not be constant, it will always be changing. 
The direction of motion is constantly changing, and in fact the direction of the acceleration is always changing. When we're at the top of this diagram, acceleration will be downward, and velocity will be to the left. When we're at the bottom, the acceleration will be upward, and the velocity will be to the right. However, as long as we're moving in circular motion, the speed will remain the same. All right, that's it for the theory. Let's go on to the questions. Question 11. Which statement correctly describes the forces acting on a satellite in orbit? Uh, we have a few options. There is no forces acting on the satellite. The net force on the satellite is zero. The net force on the satellite is the gravitational force or two forces act on the satellite, the satellite's engines, and the gravitational force. Now when there's an object in orbit, uh, it's, the only force acting on it is a centripetal force, right? It might feel weightless, but that's just because there's no reaction force. So A and B are wrong. There is a force acting on the satellite. Otherwise, it wouldn't travel in a circle. It's constantly accelerating toward the middle of the circle. So our correct answer is C. The net force in the satellite is the centripetal force pulling it toward the Earth. It doesn't need to use uh, any engines to sustain this orbit. Question 12. Draw one or more arrows on the diagram to indicate any forces acting on the satellite, which is obviously this little white circle. Label your forces. This relates a bit to the previous question. What forces are acting on the satellite? Well, there's only one. It's gravitational force. And as you would expect, it moves toward uh, the center of the Earth. So we can draw it on the diagram like so and label it Fg for force of gravity. Question 13. Account for the feeling of weightlessness that an astronaut in orbit experiences. Now, initially, we might uh, think that the weightlessness is because there's no force on the astronaut, but of course we know that that's not true. The astronaut is in free fall, right? That means that they're accelerating at exactly the same rate as their environment. And because of this, they have no reaction force. The feeling of weightlessness is not due to the absence of weight, it's due to the absence of a, of a reaction force showing you that you have weight. The astronaut still has weight even though they feel weightless. They are unable to feel any of their weight because they don't have ground pushing back on them to demonstrate their weight. Question 14. A child of mass 36 kilograms is standing on the rim of a roundabout, radius 3 meters. The roundabout is being pushed around, so the child's orbital speed is 25 meters per second. What's the centripetal force on the child? I imagine it's going to be quite large. Alright, so how do we go about figuring this out? Well, we should use the equation for centripetal force. There's our equation, f equals mv squared on r. Now what do we substitute into it? Well, we have the mass of the child. We have the radius of the circular mo motion, or the radius of the circular path. We have the speed, which will be v. So all we need to do is substitute those in. Now our equation looks something like this. We can use a calculate, calculator to evaluate that. It turns out to be 7,500 newtons towards the center, uh, which as you can see, is several times greater than the force of gravity. So the roundabout has to exert a force of 7,500 newtons toward the middle of the roundabout in order to keep the child moving in uniform circular motion. Obviously if that centripetal force disappears for whatever reason, perhaps we've let go, then we're going to continue moving on in a straight line. Question 15. A satellite of mass 260 kilograms is moving around the Earth in a circular orbit of this, uh, this radius. Earth's gravitational pull on the satellite is this force. So what is its orbital speed? 
Now, how do we calculate speed from a measure of centripetal force? Well, the answer is, of course, that we use our centripetal force equation, which has velocity in there. So, F equals mv squared on r. Now, this time, we're not trying to find force. We're trying to find our orbital speed, which in this equation is given by v. So let's rearrange this equation a bit. We can substitute in our numbers uh, 2,470 newtons for force, uh, 260 kilograms for mass, and uh, 6,500 kilometers in SI units for radius. We can see that v squared is going to be given by this expression. We've multiplied both sides by 6,500 kilometers and divided both sides by 260. And now, all we need to do is take the square root of this figure in order to figure out the orbital velocity. So, taking the square root of uh, 61,750 kilometers per second, we'll end up with uh, 7,858 meters per second because we're using SI units. Therefore, the satellite's orbital velocity uh, will be in 7,858 meters per second. The plus or minus means that we don't know whether it's rotating, uh, whether it's orbiting to the east or orbiting to the west. All right, so that's the last question, which means that now we're at the end of the lesson. So in this section, we've talked a bit about orbital velocity and how changing the orbital velocity of a satellite will change its orbit.